Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Before I even get started, look at my lips, look how they're popping. I want to say thank you so much to Miss Lynn Warren of the Queen Couture Beauty Line. She sent me this lip gloss to try on, and I absolutely love it. And I have been getting my lashes from her for almost two years now. So all of my lashes that you see, I wear in um, my videos, 98% of them come from her Queen Couture Beauty line. I will be sure to tag her uh, below in the description box. Make sure you guys check her out. All right. So uh, before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me, support this channel by liking this video. Give it a thumbs up now. You know you're going to love the video. Go ahead and like it now so you don't forget. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. And don't forget, I'm now offering Next Generation NCLEX Review Part 1 and Part 2, one-on-one -on -one private tutoring sessions, consultation sessions. And while you're there, when you go to my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com, and you're reserving your spot, be sure to check out the audio lessons I have, a, have available. Now, these audio lessons, they've been specifically made for students who are currently in the program that really need a high grade on their next test to pass, right? So those audio lessons are catered for you. Um, they're subject specific. And I go over the most important things you need to know about that subject and what you're most likely going to see on your exam. So you can at least know how to focus for your test. So be sure to check that out on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Um, Again, Queen Couture Beauty line. Thank you so much. I will be sure to tag them in the description. All right, guys, without any further ado, let's get started. Nursing exit exam concepts part two. Your patient with hyperthyroidism is prescribed propanolol. How can you tell if the desired effect is achieved? Would it be decreased T3, T4 levels? Would it be an increase in the goiter? Would it be a decrease in the goiter? Or would it be a decrease in the pulse rate? What do you guys think? Okay, the correct answer is a decrease in the pulse rate. So here's something, guys. I don't want you, whenever you get a test question about a patient that has a diagnosis and they're on a medication and they're asking you a question, 99% of the time they're asking you about that medication, not the diagnosis. So the patient has hyperthyroidism. So their T3 and T4 is increased. Their metabolic rate is increased. Their heart rate is increased. Their blood pressure is increased. Their GI tract, what? Increased. Motility, everything's increased, right? They're being given this medication, propanolol, which is a beta blocker. What does this medication do? It's going to bring down that blood pressure, but it's also going to bring down the heart rate. Boom, decrease in pulse rate. That is the correct answer. Although the patient with hyperthyroidism, they've got too much T3, T4, we want to bring that down. That's not what propanolol does. So we, we wouldn't choose this. The patient with hyperthyroidism, they may have a goiter. We'd want to decrease the goiter, but that, guess what? This medication, the beta blocker doesn't do that. And it doesn't decrease, the, it doesn't increase the goiter. It doesn't decrease the goiter, goiter. What it does is it decreases the blood pressure and it decreases the heart rate, okay? Which circumstance represents sterile technique or sterility? Would it be the one inch border around the sterile field? Would it be a two by two sterile gauze on a wet tabletop? Would it be a sterile field behind the nurse or would it be a sterile field above the level of the nurse's waist? Which one would be considered sterile? If you're on the live and you weren't able to join the Kahoot, you can put in your answer on the live guys. All right, very good. The correct answer is the sterile field above the level of the waist. Anything that is below the level of the waist is no longer considered sterile. Anything that is behind you, that is behind the nurse, is no longer considered sterile. Even if you have a two by two or four by four, you have a gauze that is in the, the package. The package has not been open, but it got wet. Guess what? It's no longer sterile, 
Okay, so you place it on a wet countertop, it's no longer sterile. So the only one here that is considered sterile is going to be the sterile field above the nurse's waist. Now I noticed 24 of you guys chose the one inch border around um, the sterile field. That part is not sterile. That's the part that you can actually touch, right? That one inch outer portion is not the sterile field, okay? Your CHF patient is being discharged home. Which instruction is most important to include in the discharge plan? Would it be to eat a low-fat diet? Would it be to dorsiflex both feet twice a day? Would it be to check the skin turgor three times a day? Or would it be to perform daily weights? You have a CHF patient that's being discharged home. What's most important to teach them? Very good. I'm so proud of you guys, you who are doing the Kahoot and those who are on the live. Both of you guys are on fire tonight. Absolutely right. When it comes, first of all, let's talk about CHF. That's um, congestive heart failure. We're going to be concerned about how much fluid that patient's holding on to because that heart can't even take all of that fluid, right? So the best indication of, of the patient's fluid status and how much they're holding on to is daily weights. It is not INO. It is not skin turgor. It is daily weights. You are going to weigh that patient every morning before they eat, same type of clothes, same scale, daily weights. Very good. Your patient has been prescribed furosemide, Lasix, and you note that the potassium level is three. What is going to be your priority nursing action? Is it going to be to give high potassium foods like bananas, apricots, and potatoes? Would you assess the INO hourly? Would you assess the patient's cardiac rhythm and rate? Or would you assess the skin turgor? What is going to be your priority nursing action? Wonderful, that's right. You're gonna assess that cardiac rate and rhythm because guess what? Hyperkalemia, potassium higher than five or hypokalemia, kalemia, potassium lower than 3.5 on both ends of the spectrum that can cause the patient to have cardiac dysrhythmias. So anything outside of that very narrow therapeutic range, which is 3.5 to five, that's it guys. 3.5 to 5. Anything outside of that, we're going to be concerned about cardiac dysrhythmias. Your patient is prescribed Alteplase, a thrombolytic agent. We talked about this last night. Your patient has a bowel movement. What action should you take? Are you going to send the stool sample to the lab for guaiac testing? Are you going to check the stool for clay-colored appearance? Are you going to obtain a culture and sensitivity on the stool? Or are you going to assess the stool for fat or yellow streaks? Okay, let's talk about this because a lot of you guys on the live were saying clay colored and 16 of you guys chose that here. The correct answer is you're gonna be checking um, that sample for um, guaiac testing. Do you know what that means? That means hidden blood. I want you to think about it. So the patient's being given alteplase and I even told you what alteplase was. You didn't even have to guess that it's a thrombolytic agent. I told you it's a thrombolytic agent. Thrombo, thrombus, a clot, lytic, lysis to break down. So it's an agent that breaks down blood clots, which means that the patient's at risk for what? Bleeding. So when the patient has a bowel movement, we're going to check that stool for hidden blood. We want to make sure there's no internal hemorrhage going on. That word guaiac, that means hidden, hidden. We're going to be looking for hidden blood in the stool. Okay. Select all that applies. Your platelet count, your patient's platelet count, excuse me, is 111,000. 
What should be your nursing intervention? Select all that applies. Would it be to administer high fiber foods and stool softeners as ordered? Would it be to administer aspirin as ordered? Are you going to teach the patient to use an electric razor? Are you going to apply pressure to venipuncture, venipuncture sites for at least three minutes? Are you going to initiate isolation precautions, or are you going to place the patient on bed rest? This is select all that applies. So there can be more than one answer here. What are you guys going to do? Okay, let's talk about it. Platelet at 111,000. The normal platelet should be at least 150,000, right? Your range is about 150,000 to 400,000, right? At 111,000, that's too low. So this patient's at risk for bleeding. So yes, you're gonna give high fiber foods and stool softeners as ordered because the last thing we want is for this patient to be straining, to have a bowel movement and for the stool to be hard, right? And so for them to start um, having uh, bright red bleeding from the rectum, we don't want that. We want the stool to be soft. So that's correct. Yes, we're going to teach them to use an electric razor so they don't cut themselves. Everything else is wrong. Let's talk about this. 13 of you guys chose administer aspirin as ordered. This patient is already at risk for bleeding. Do you think it's a good idea to give them aspirin? Absolutely not. Anybody who's at risk for bleeding, you're not going to give them aspirin. 32 of you chose this. Apply pressure to venipuncture sites. I was with you so far, but let's keep going for at least three minutes. And let me tell you something. That is how NCLEX, that is how HESI, that is how ATI will trick you every single day of the week. They'll give you the first portion of the answer, which is right. And they'll get you all excited thinking you got the answer. And then the last part is wrong. What you mean three minutes? Any patient who's at risk for bleeding, minimum five minutes, but most of the textbooks are going to say at least 10 minutes. So there's no way it's going to be three minutes. Okay. If one portion of the answer is incorrect, the whole thing is incorrect. No, how, no matter how beautiful it looks to you, don't choose it. Next, initiate isolation precaution. 16 of you guys chose that. Why? Is there an infectious process going on? Does the patient have meningitis or something? Absolutely not. Why are we putting in uh, I putting them in isolation? That's not necessary. And it's not necessary to put them on bed rest. We just have to keep them safe and prevent them from bleeding. Your patient just had a stroke. For which finding would you expect a speech evaluation to be performed? Would it be facial drooping? coughing while eating, confusion, or mood swings. Your patient just had a stroke. Which finding would make you expect a speech evaluation to be performed? Facial drooping, coughing while eating, confusion, or mood swings. What do you guys think? Okay, awesome. 26 of you guys chose coughing while eating. Yes. So if a patient just had a stroke, right? The very first time after a patient has a stroke, the registered nurse has to feed that patient. She cannot delegate feeding the patient to an unlicensed assisted personnel, a PCT, a CNA, not even an LPN or an RN, uh, excuse me, an LPN or LVN. The registered nurse has to be the one to feed that patient the first time after a stroke. And the reason for that is if a patient's had a stroke, most likely they've got some kind of deficits, right? And we want to make sure that one of them is not swallowing. So the RN has to be the one feeding that patient after the stroke, because while they're feeding the patient, they're looking, is the patient coughing? Are they gagging, right? Because if they look like they're having any difficulty swallowing, we need a swallow study. Well, guess where the swallow study is done? It's done during the speech evaluation. That leads me to another point. Only the registered nurse 
calls the healthcare provider and say, hey, can we get a, a, a speech um, evaluation done? Guys, I'm not talking about the real life. In real life, things are different. But in the testing world, it's the registered nurse that calls for a speech evaluation, physical therapy evaluation, occupational therapy evaluation. If an evaluation needs to be done or the nurse suspects it needs to be done, it's the registered nurse that calls, right? So it's the registered nurse that feeds the patient. And if she sees any difficulty, like the patient's gagging, they're going to call the healthcare provider and ask for a speech eval because a swallow study is done during the speech eval, okay? Now, for 18 of you that chose facial drooping, you, I know why you chose facial drooping. You chose facial drooping because I told you the patient has a stroke, but the question's not asking you about the stroke. The question's asking you about the speech evaluation. What do you know in the patient that will make you expect to have a speech evaluation performed? Make sure you're answering the question. Your patient has cholecystitis. Which type of foods would you encourage? Would it be high protein, low fat, low sodium, or high fiber? I'm sorry, I spelled fiber wrong. I put an extra R. Your patient has cholecystitis. What type, what type of foods are you going to encourage them to eat? High protein, low fat, low sodium, or high fiber? Very good, low fat. Think about it, what is cholecystitis? So they've got inflammation of what? The gallbladder, remember the gallbladder is responsible for holding bile. Bile has that enzyme that breaks down fat. So the more fatty substances that you eat, the more you're gonna make your gallbladder work hard. Well, why would you make your gallbladder work hard if it's already inflamed? You wanna rest your gallbladder if you're having um, inflammation of your gallbladder. If you have cholecystitis, you want to rest the gallbladder. So you need to eat foods that are low in fat. How many heart sounds should the average patient have? One, two, three, or four? This is an easy one. How many heart sounds should the average patient have? Okay, very good. Most of you guys chose the correct answer. And it's two. Some of you guys chose four. What? So <laughs> your average patient should have your love and your dub. Two, love, dub, love, dub. Your S1, S2, S1, S2, S1, S2, right? When it comes to S3, you hear S3 heart sound, you'll be thinking of something like, you know, CHS. Something's going on with that patient. Unless, you know, unless, you know, the patient's very young, it's a child or, you know, it's a super athletic person, it's an athlete. But other than that, your normal average patient should just have two heart sounds, your S1 and your S2. Which is an early sign of ICP? What is an early sign of increased intracranial pressure? Is it fixed dilated pupils? Is it lethargy? Is it decorticate posturing? or clear drainage from the ear, which do you think is an early sign of increased intracranial pressure? Wow, 22 of you guys chose fixed dilated pupils. Fixed dilated pupils, that is a late sign of intracranial pressure. If you wait until your patient has fixed dilated pupils for you to figure out something's wrong, you're not a really good nurse, right? So an early sign of increased intracranial pressure is going to be lethargy. Lethargy, confusion, irritability, any change in what? Cognition. That is going to be your very, very early first sign and symptom that something's wrong, something's going on with the brain. Fixed dilated pupils, that's a late sign. Decorticate posturing, that is a late sign. And I'm happy only five of you guys chose clear drainage from the ear, but clear drainage from the ear, that lets you know that there's, you know, cerebrospinal fluid leak, 
right? It's leaking, but not so much increased intracranial pressure. Early sign of increased intracranial pressure, again, are going to be changes in cognition and how a patient thinks or even behaves. So you may see anxiety, irritability, um, 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 lethargy, confusion. Those are early signs of increased intracranial pressure. Select all that applies. When should pain be considered a priority? Pain never killed anyone, but there are certain situations we are going to treat pain as we would everything else that falls under physiological integrity in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So what are those situations where we are going to treat pain as a priority? Here are your options. Select all that applies. Cancer, sickle cell crisis, burns, stones, myocardial infarction, urinary tract infection. What do you guys say? All right, everything except for UTI. Most of you guys on the live, you said everything except for UTI and you were correct. So cancer, sickle cell crisis, burn stones and myocardial infarction. Those are the five situations. If this is happening with your patient, you are going to treat pain as a priority. Pain never killed anyone except for those situations, cancer, sickle cell crisis, burn stones and myocardial infarction. Pain has to be addressed. It needs to be a priority. You're caring for a patient that was admitted with suicidal thoughts. Which behavior shows the highest risk for carrying out those thoughts? Would it be expression of anger and sadness? Neglect of personal hygiene? Lack of interest in things previously enjoyed? Or showing improvement in affect? What sign or symptom or what dis display of behavior would make you think that that patient's more at risk for carrying out those suicidal thoughts? What do you guys think? That's right. Showing improvement in affect. You were admitted with depression, suicidal thoughts. All of a sudden, you're happy. All of a sudden, you're smiling, all of a sudden you have a happy disposition. Why? Why? Is it because you finally come up with your plan of how you're going to commit suicide? Is it because you, you feel like you're finally going to be free and so that's why you're happy? Is it because you've been medicated and now you have just enough energy to follow through with your plan? Yeah. So the patients who are admitted with suicidal thoughts where they have anger, depression, resentment, sadness, all of these horrible things are turned towards self. That's what depression is. They, they feel that towards themselves, right? And then they start getting antidepressants and you notice all of a sudden they're happy. You better watch them much closely because very often the reason why they're happy or you see an improvement is their, in their affect is because they finally figured out all of the nurse's schedule and they know they'll have two minutes between change of shift to get it done. Or they feel like they finally, um, they're finally going to be able to end it. Or they feel like they have just enough energy to get it done. That's the one you need to be watching the closest, okay? You go to measure the fundus of your postpartum patient and note that it's deviated to the left. What do you do? Do you massage the fundus? Check for distended bladder, increase the rate of IV fluids, or review the hemoglobin level for bleeding. You go to measure the fundus of your postpartum patient and you notice that it's deviated to the left. What are you going to do? Massage it, check for distended bladder, increase IV fluids, or review hemoglobin levels. I am so proud of you guys. 
I'm so proud because I thought you were going to fall for the trap that I set for you where I said massage the fundus because I know there was that viral video that um, went around of me telling you to massage the fundus, but I'm telling you to massage the fundus when the fundus is what? Soft and boggy, not deviated. So I'm so happy. Everyone who chose, check distended bladder. Absolutely. When it's deviated, most likely what's happening is the person's bladder is full and that's what's causing the deviation. So you're going to check for distended bladder. If the fundus is soft or boggy, that's when you're going to massage it, right? Because you don't want them to bleed out. Very good. As you're taking your patient's blood pressure, you note spasms of the fingers and hand of the arm that you're doing the blood pressure. What would you suspect? Is it Trousseau sign? Is it Chovstek sign? Is it hyperkalemia or is it hypokalemia? You're taking the patient's blood pressure and all of a sudden you're seeing spasms of that hand and fingers of which you're taking that blood pressure. What do you suspect? Trousseau's, Chovstek, hyperkalemia or hypokalemia? Very good, Trousseau's. So you take in the patient's blood pressure and all of a sudden you're seeing this right here, right? Or you're seeing that flapping. That's a type of tetany. And that is Trousseau's. That's a sign of hypocalcemia, right? If you were to touch their cheek and you saw them spasming like this, that is this form of tetany and that's called Cholstec. And the way you remember that Cholstec starts with a C and so does cheek. So the cheek is Trostec. The blood pressure one is Trousseau's. Hyperkalemia and hypokalemia, with those two, you'd see cardiac dysrhythmias. Which action cannot be delegated to an LPN slash LVN? Would it be sterile wound care? Would it be suctioning a trach? Would it be blood transfusions or would it be administration of routine meds? Which one under no circumstances can you delegate to an LPN, LVN? You got it. Blood transfusion. So when it comes to testing, guys, the LPN will always get the most stable patient. They're going to get the patient with um, the routine meds, the most routine meds with the most um, reliable outcome that most likely we know what the outcome is going to be. They're going to get the most stable patient. They can do wound care. Um, they can do, they can suction trach. They can do vet patients. They can give, do IV fluids, you know, depending on the state, they might need, you know, um, special certification or training, but they can still do that. But what they can't do are blood transfusions. They can't do blood transfusions. They can't do central lines. They can't um, do, um, they can't create care plans, right? They can follow the care plan, but they can't create them. Blood transfusion, absolutely not. That's the correct answer. All right, guys, last question. Your patient is newly admitted with a diagnosis of bipolar disorder and they're in the manic phase. What assessment takes priority? Is it going to be um, self-neglect? Is it going to be disturbed sleep patterns? Is it going to be imbalanced nutrition? Or is it going to be self-hygiene deficit? Your patient's newly admitted with a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. They are in the manic phase. What's your priority? Self-neglect, disturbed sleep, imbalanced nutrition, self-hygiene. What do you guys say? All right. 16 of you chose a disturbed sleep pattern. And I understand why you would choose that, but let me tell you something. Between disturbed sleep pattern and imbalanced nutrition, imbalanced nutrition is going to win every single day of the week. You'll live longer not sleeping than not eating, okay? Whenever you're being asked about priority, you have to think about what is either keeping your patient alive the longest or what can kill them the fastest. Priority. What are we talking about priority? If you don't understand Maslow's hierarchy of needs, when we talk about priority, I'm going to give you a second. Write this down. Those of you who are on the live, grab a pen. Make sure you understand this. What am I talking about? I, Sugar said, keep keeping the patient alive. That's right. I'm talking about nutrition, fluid and electrolytes, glucose, airway, breathing, circulation, signs and symptoms of a seizure, signs and symptoms of a stroke, signs and symptoms of dehydration. Come on now. Anything that keeps your patient alive or that can kill them. 
that's going to be priority. And so even when you're down to two answers, you have to think to yourself, okay, what's going to keep my patient alive the longest? Even though the stirred sleep pattern is a problem, they're in the manic phase. They're not getting much sleep, but guess what? They're not eating much either because they're in the manic phase. They're going, they're going, they're going. They're not stopping to eat. That's why those type of patients, you got to give them finger foods because they're not going to stop to eat a meal. You got to give them a sandwich and a bottle of water. And when it comes to NCLEX and ATI and HESI, usually um, for nutrition, you'll get one of these two type of questions, either this one that I gave you this example, or it'll be the same situation, but except the patient being manic, it'll be a patient that comes in with anorexia or bulimia, right? We're still going to be concerned about nutrition and or fluid electrolytes. How are you guys doing on the live? Okay, wonderful. All right, guys, those of you who stuck out to the end, thank you so much for watching this video. Now let's see how you guys did.